So today we're gonna dive into the four stages a man goes through before he fully commits. And I think this will be really valuable information for everyone. Now we have to recognize that a lot of couples today attach at a very, they attach and bond in an unhealthy way. Let me repeat that, they attach and bond in an unhealthy way. In many cases, people are experiencing childhood wounds and traumas and adult traumas that make it very difficult for them to actually form a healthy, happy relationship with another human being. And because humans are thirsty for companionship, they're thirsty for connection, they're thirsty for physical intimacy one, with one another, there's this hyper-focus on attraction in the early stages without really determining true compatibility with another human being. Say that, let me say it again, true compatibility with another human being. Why did these men take so long? Because compatibility takes time. Building a relationship with a person takes time and you have to really lean into that desire for men in particular to reach that point of saying, I want to be all in. And what is all in? It means I want to take care of you. I'm gonna repeat that one more time. I wanna take care of you. That's what all in means. That doesn't necessarily mean financially take care of you, but it's like the wedding vows for better, for poor, for richer, for thin, <laughs> richer, thin, in sickness and in health. In other words, it's not just about the good times. See, today, most relationships hyper-focus on all the good, and they're unaware of these four stages of really building a partnership with someone that helps develop that healthy, juicy, delicious, happy relationship I often talk about. So the other day I was reading about, uh, this is something I've known for some time called the 90 day rule, the 90 day rule. And basically it says something to the effect that if a relationship reaches a 90 day mark, it has a greater chance for relationship success than it doesn't. Now that seems to make sense. And I, I wanna share my own personal experience here. After my significant relationship ended some six years ago, actually, yeah, it was six years ago, uh, the beginning of this month, <laughs> and I think about it, my dating was rather sparse. And what I mean to say, I, I made effort in dating, but it was certainly, it wasn't this going out on a date once a week, okay? <laughs> um, I was a bit selective, and I found myself going through experiences like this, and maybe you can relate. I'd meet someone online through a, you know, a dating app, okay? Dating apps, right? Um, dating apps. <laughs> All my apps are no longer on my phone, my dating apps. And I'd meet, and you know, I'd connect with someone, we'd go back and forth, we'd communicate with one another, and we have a first date. Now, it seems to me that probably in those six years before, or those uh, five years before I met my sweetheart, Marie, there's a picture of her right there, I went on several dozens of first dates. And of those several dozens, I think uh, it was probably maybe 30 in a period of six years, maybe 40, something like that. I think only three of them ever got to a second date. Three of them out of these 40 in this period of time ever got to a second date. Now for some of them, I most of the time I wasn't a fit, I, I wasn't interested in them. And there were a couple that weren't interested in me. And I do, I do specifically remember that two of them turned into second dates. And in these two second dates, actually these numbers aren't accurate. There were more than there were more than three that got to a second date. Or but let me just keep going with this. Now that I come back, there's a couple other women in there. All right. So really quickly, very of that 40, 50 people, maybe now I'm increasing it to 50 because I'm not hundred percent sure, because I had a lot of meet and greets. Very few of them got to a second date. And I remember specifically only one ever made it to three, four, five, six, seven, eight dates, okay, of those one. And so coming back to what I was talking about within this 90 day rule, you think about it, out of 50, let's say meet and greets, only one of them got to a third, fourth or fifth date. And, and that one didn't even make it to the 90 day mark. Now, this can be very discouraging to think about this, but that's the reality of life. 
we're not a fit for most people. Most people aren't in an emotionally healthy place to actually form a healthy, happy relationship. So when I talk about what I'm gonna talk about today is for those people who are serious about a relationship, they're serious about partnership, they're serious about commitment, and they're in an emotionally good place to get there. Because when you attach to someone in an unhealthy place, okay, why would men hit the 90 day mark and bail on someone, okay? And I, I had a few of those prior to, uh, shortly after my marriage, I had a few relationships that hit the 90 day mark and it didn't go anywhere. It was because I realized in the beginning stages when the chemistry was taking us off in the rocket ship and I was excited on that high, once I got past that high, I had to evaluate, is this person really right for me? Do I really feel this, do I feel like this is the right person for me? And usually it took off in six weeks and then it started to drop after six weeks and it hit that 90 day mark. And this isn't a, you know, this isn't an accurate number. This is just merely a guideline. But after 90 days, and I think this is true for all men, we kind of have this evaluation. Is this person someone I want to go on this ride with? Do I want to go on this ride of being in relationship with? And yet, here's the tricky part. An emotionally unhealthy man, emotionally who is wounded, who has unresolved traumas, unresolved, unhealed wounds in his life, he's going to want that companionship, connection, and sex, and he'll settle for mediocrity. A lot of men will settle on a mediocre relationship because having some connection with someone, having some companionship, having some sex is better than none. This got me thinking, and now I'm going to do a rabbit here. This got me thinking to how many men are in marriages who are unhappy in marriages but won't go anywhere. Do you realize that women initiate 70 to 80% of divorces and men don't? Why? Because a man will be in an unhappy relationship and stick with it. Now, some of those men might cheat and get their needs met elsewhere, or they hyper-focus in their professional capacity to get their needs met. But think about that for a second. See, women initiate more divorces because they want something deeper, which I'm about to share. So I'm going to, today I'm going to apply, I have to read my notes for a second for everyone, because this isn't something I memorized. Today I'm going to apply the Tuckman model to illustrate a point. The Tuckman model. Tuckman stages of development, the FSNP, describe the four stages of psychological development a team goes through as they work on a project. project. Teams move through each stage as they overcome challenges, learn to work together, and eventually focus on accomplishing a shared goal. Can I read that again, everybody? The Tuckman stages of development describe the four stages of psychological development a team goes through as they work on a project. Teams move through each stage as they overcome challenges, learn to work together, and eventually focus on accomplishing a shared goal. See, don't you all want to be in a team? Don't you want to be in a partnership with someone? I know that when Marie and I first met, we wanted that. And in a moment, I'm going to share those four stages. But we had to get, and, and so those four stages are critically important. So I want you to take notes. If you're watching the replay, write this down and eventually go Google this. And again, I'm applying something to romantic relationships. For the first stage is the norming stage, the norming stage. Now, norming is mostly focused on attraction. Okay, but there's more to it than that. And when I think about Marie and I in those early stages of dating, what was it that got us in this norming stage? Or excuse me, oh, I totally screwed up. I read it wrong, I apologize. The forming stage, the forming stage. I wish I could go back and edit this, but I can't. I was reading my notes and I read it uh, wrong. The forming stage, just like Marie and I began to form this relationship together. Now, I made some notes of what it took for us to get in this forming stage. Of course, we had mutual attraction for one another. I think it was physical and emotional, but it wasn't off the charts attraction. Um, there was actually more emotional chemistry between the two of us than it was actually physical chemistry. 
We both had time to invest in the relationship, the getting to know you period. We had the time to invest. This is where a lot of you get involved in these long distance dynamics. See, this only counts once you're physically physically in each other's space and you're physically getting together with one another on a regular basis. So in our case, we had time to invest. We also vibed well with each other. Um, you know, we, we just vibed well with each other. We just seemed to share the same things in life. We just, we, we didn't have a lot of friction. We didn't have, you know, arguments about vaccines or politics or religion. We just seemed to vibe well together on the things we were both interested in. We had similar relationship visions. We had similar relationship visions, okay? We were both financially stable. I think that's a critically important piece of the puzzle because when you get when you consider that 50% of all marriage divorces cite money as the problem, it's good to be in a good financial place, okay? We lined up sexually with one another. We had really good sex once we began being physically intimate with one another. We shared similar values. I know one of our values that we share is punctuality. Um, and there's multitude of values. If you Google list of, just type in list of values, you'll see what values. And I would invite you to look at the most important ones for yourself. And we tended to operate as a team right from the very beginning when we were planning, we were a long distance relationship, when we were planning trips together, we worked as a team. We took turns paying. It was like figuring out our schedules. We were operating as a team. We were in this forming stage in our relationship. And this is true of the beginning stages of commitment. We need to form together, okay? in a healthy way. Many of you are attaching in an unhealthy way. We can talk about that when we do Q&A. Now the next stage, and again, I wanna repeat, I, I misspoke in the beginning, it's forming in the first stage. The second stage is storming. This is where your differences begin to emerge. I know, see when you're storming stage, this is where your differences begin to surface up, surface, or to the top, rise to the top. And this is where it can be, oh, excuse me for slurping. This is where it can be contentious. Your communication styles can be different. Your investment in the relationship can be different. In other words, your desire for commitment can be different. When I talk about communication styles, I know women oftentimes expect men to initiate all of the communication. And I can tell you for most part, men in midlife are tired of being the ones initiating. Now, doesn't, but that means he's not a man, Jonathan, because men are provider protectors and they're supposed to initiate, and they're supposed to lead the relationship. You know, I know a significant percentage of people who by the time they had midlife, they've gone through divorce. And just keep in mind, roughly 75% of people over 45 years are divorced. They're gun shy, they're burnt out. So again, the expectation of communication style might not, might create tension between two people as an example, or the expectation of how much you communicate. And they start having these differences. And through these differences, they're storming in the relationship. Now, a lot of men want it easy, so they bail in this space. Oh, I should have said in the early, in the forming stage, remember that 90 day period where it takes off and kind of comes back down? They're in that forming stage. God, I keep getting confusing the two. The forming stage and they go, you know, she's not the one for me. And by the way, you ladies go through this experience as well. Sadly, many of you will bond to a man that you're not happy with either. I want you to think about that. How many of you are attached to, have been attached to a man who wasn't right for you and yet you wanted to make it work? You, you found the money pit and you're like, I wanna invest more and more of myself into this broken home, hoping it's gonna yield some results later on down the road. So coming back to the storming stage, this is where most people fall apart. Men sadly want it easy. Most, un, uh, let me reframe that. Most unconscious, emotionally wounded men want it easy. For someone like myself, I knew this was going to happen between the two of us, and we've had a couple. We Our differences certainly do surface up, and we have the capacity to talk through these differences 
And in the, in the, in the, in the, friend of mine calls them threshold barriers. When you cross a threshold barrier, a storm with someone, it strengthens your relationship. It's like the way steel is made when you temper it with heat and then pound it and temper it with heat and pound it. That's how it becomes stronger. See, it's through the storming stage when you can overcome the bumps. Now, sometimes they're just little bumps and sometimes they're gigantic bumps. A lot of people don't make it past that. That's just the reality of life. But when you get through the bumps, you reach the next stage of, of norming, <laughs> of norming, overcoming the differences because the whole is greater than the parts. What that means to say is you're in a state of gratitude for this relationship because there's more good in the relationship than there is bad. Now, for some people, the bad is just unbearable and it's not worth staying in. This is true for men and women alike. But when you can get to this norming stage where you've gone through some of your bumps and you can start, you know, and you feel a sense of trust with one another, you feel a sense of trust. In that trust, trust isn't just about fidelity. Trust is, does this person have my best interest at heart? See, that's what should start to feel like in the uh, norming stage. You should feel a sense of trust. Now, for some couples, they've reached this space of calm, but they're actually, they're still in mediocre relationships. They're in mediocre relationships. This is where they feel unfulfilled. So you can reach this stage, but still feel unfulfilled in this space. This is why reaching the fourth stage is critically important. And that's the performing stage, the performing stage. And I'm going to repeat all these one more time. Can someone write it in the chat box or someone write it uh, in, the, in the replay in the comments? The performing stage, a shared vision and growing together consciously. It's finding that space where you really bond together in a common way, where you, you have this shared vision, this shared passion with one another. You know, I think for my sweetheart, I'm, I'm a, she's addicted to travel and I've certainly got the travel bug right now. And so that's something we have a shared vision. We have already, we have trips planned for the next year. We have three big trips planned over the next year. And we're working, actually, technically we have four. We already have this plan. We have this shared vision. It's in this space of growing together. We do work, oh, by the way, um, someone, let me just put, um, these stages again. The first stage is forming. The second stage is storming. The third stage is norming. And the fourth stage, which I'm talking about right now, is performing. And this is where you actually are mutually investing in the relationship from this heart-centered space of talking about more intimate things. Because in this space, and you're talking about your passion, your dreams, your vision, and you find that mutual space together, that's where you're actually performing at a much higher level. And so the Tuckman model that I'm using for this illustration, I feel can be applied in relationships as well. In fact, there's a really interesting book I wanna share with everyone. Um, this is a business book called The Partnership Star Charter. How to start out right with your new business partnership. You know. Why I'm recommending this book is because when you think about it, when two business people get together and they decide to form a partnership, there's this mutual exchange that happens with one another. You see, a lot of data, oh my God, there's so much rhetoric out there that is insisting upon telling women that men are the leaders of the relationship and you are in a submissive role. And I'm here to say the best relationships are a co-creative dynamic where you take the strengths and weaknesses of another and you balance it together and you find where what you're good at, like Marie is good at travel. She's good at planning these things. I'm terrible at this stuff. See, this is where we reach this performing stage as an example, and you take your strengths and weaknesses and apply it to the relationship, not in a one up, one down dynamic that we've been sold for hundreds of thousands of years, but in a partnership type of dynamic 
because you don't need a leader in the relationship. What you need is a cooperative person in relationships. The best relationships are with two givers. And being cooperative in a team-like fashion, think of all the basketball championships like the Boston Celtics or the Lakers had. It's because they had coaches that taught them to work as a team. And I'm here to say, just like those guys that talked about earlier that said it took them a while to get to all in, I want to encourage how to get all in at an earlier stage by recognizing these stages of relationship and applying just some of the simple tools I shared today to help you form a healthy, happy relationship. All right, I'm going to repeat it one more time. It's the forming, storming, norming, and performing. That's the Tuckman's model, Tuckman's model. All right, I hope you have found value in this. If you did, please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel. Hit that bell. If you have some thoughts, please post a comment below. I'd like to hear them. Uh, if you need some support, check out the link to a free discovery call with me to see if working with a coach is right for you. All right, it's time for Q&A.